Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone. My name is Meg Olson, and I am the Grassroots Mobilization Director here at Network Lobby. And we're so glad that you can join us today. Today, we are having our webinar on our network's 2022 legislative agenda, where we will look at our build a new agenda and how it relates to this year and the 117th Congress. Our agenda today, first, we will hear from Mary Novak, our executive director. Mary will provide um, a brief analysis of the State of the Union from Tuesday night and remind us of our Build a New Cornerstones. Then we'll hear from our government relations team. We'll hear from Christian Watkins talking about the criminal legal system reform. We'll hear from Laura Peralta Schulte about Build Back Better 2.0 and our priorities in that. We'll receive some updates, first from Jared Smith on HR 40 and reparations, then from Gina Kelly on labor, then from Christian again, uh, Watkins on democracy, and Renette osser -Watham on immigration. We'll have some time for questions and answers, and then um, we will have our call to action. But before we begin, just a few housekeeping. We do have closed captioning available if you need it, and it is down on your uh, toolbar. You can just click it on. They are imperfect, but uh, they're for your ease. Also, you can you please use the question and answer box to type in questions about policies for our lobbyists. That way we can track the questions very easily and we can even get back to you over email if we have longer answers or don't have time to answer all of your questions. And you can type in questions at any point throughout the webinar. So please use the Q&A box to ask those questions. Um, we have Emily on tech. She has tech in front of her name. And so if you are having any other issues that aren't policy related questions, uh, you can message Emily, um, and there are other network staff on hand as well who can help you with tech. All right, and so first we begin with Mary Novak talking about the State of the Union. Thank you, Meg, and let me uh, add my welcome to the ones that you received from Meg. It is so good to be with you all. And for those of you who were with us on Tuesday as our community prepared for the State of the Union, welcome back. So let me uh, start with just a few words about the State of the Union. The context is really important. So some good things got done last year. The American Rescue Plan, the bipartisan infrastructure bill, and it was also a year of learning for the president, one about what was possible in light of the numbers in Congress. And then just last week, the world shifted and Russia invaded Ukraine. Yeah, that was just last Thursday. It feels like a year ago for some of us. And what we are seeing already is a shift among the members of Congress because of the invasion. And then of course, there are the midterms coming up and that is also critical. So this is the context of President Biden's State of the Union address where he spoke forcefully in favor of a number of our key issues, especially on the economy. And he did it through a frame of solidarity and encounter and emphasizing the importance of community. And he did all of this in the face of the terrible culture wars we are living through and the racist tropes forming the narratives that continue these culture wars. So one of my favorite lines was, capitalism without competition isn't capitalism. It's exploitation. Talk about clarity, right? President Biden also spoke about closing the Medicaid gap, lowering the cost of prescription drugs, 
extending the child tax credit, making corporations and the wealthiest pay their fair share, raising the minimum wage, passing the PRO Act, and passing the Paycheck Fairness Act, as well as paid leave. He also spoke about the historic nomination to the Supreme Court of Judge Brown Jackson, a nomination the network community has fully endorsed, applauded, and celebrated. And President Biden even said, vaccinate the world. Now, did we want more? Did we want him to broaden his unity vision a bit wider? Absolutely. In particular, we wanted more on democracy, criminal legal system reform, immigration. And we're gonna talk about all that tonight and much more about the work ahead. But before we do, let me remind you how Network approaches this political ministry. Every four years, we set our agenda out of what we have heard from families and communities across the country. And last year, as we do at the beginning of every presidential term, we put in place Network's Build a New Agenda. And the Build a New Agenda is grounded in four cornerstones, dismantling systemic racism, cultivating inclusive community, rooting our economy in solidarity, and transforming our politics. And all of these come straight out of our understanding of Catholic social teaching in the political life. If you wanna read more about these cornerstones, we had academic and public theologians reflect on them in our fourth quarter connection magazine last year. It's on our website if you wanna read them again and don't have the paper copy in, in hand. But with that context and that grounding, let's jump into the substance of our work ahead for the second session of the 117th Congress, as well as the administrative work that it could be necessary as well. So let me turn it over to Christian Watkins, Network's Government Relations Advocate. Christian. Hello everyone and welcome to this webinar. <clears throat> Mary, thank you. And Meg, thank you for your introduction of the program. Um, in regards to criminal, to the criminal legal system reform work. We definitely want to, I want to start out by um, elevating and honoring the historic nomination of, um, of Judge uh, Brown to the, um, uh, to federal, to the federal bench. Um, I have no, uh, I have all hope that Judge Kintanji uh, Brown Jackson's nomination will um, be honored and that she will be seated. Um, following Justice Breyer's uh, retirement announcement, she it comes immensely qualified um, and has shown unwavering commitment to equal justice. This historic nomination will bring uh, the United States, bring the Supreme Court just steps closer to the reflecting the diversity of our country. And her being the first Black woman ever to be nominated to the United States Supreme Court makes this especially exciting. We're definitely excited about uh, her nomination in the criminal justice uh, reform spaces here in Washington, D.C., and no doubt that excitement is um, felt across the country. Um, but I want to go, but I will also want to go into um, some other pieces, some pieces of legislation that are moving, that, that are moving through Congress and that are being uh, considered and debated and uh, advocated for here in D.C. Um, as far as substance abuse justice, um, be on the lookout for information regarding the Mainstream Addiction Treatment Act. Uh, or more commonly known as the MAD Act, um, that uh, MAD Act um, will, uh, it, because of uh, President Biden's State of the Union address that called for the country to get rid of outdated rules and to stop doctors from prescribing treatments for substance abuse disorders. Um, the support, his, his statement supports uh, the clear need for Congress to pass policies like the Mainstreaming Addiction Treatment Act uh, with urgency so that uh, we can 
uh, address, successfully address over the overdose crisis demands. Um, there, for this piece of legislation, there are 220, 244 bipartisan members of the House and Senate who support the MAD Act. Um, but be on the lookout for more information um, via uh, networks uh, communications um, about that specific piece of legislation. And regarding policing reform, um, after 200 attempts made uh, to make lynching um, that Jim Crow relic of uh, federal hate crime, which still happens today, um, H.R. 55, the Emmett Till Anti-Lynching Act was introduced by, in the House by Bobby Rush on January 4th and, of 2021 and passed 40, 422 to 3 um, on February 28th of this year. So at the end of February, at the end of Black History Month, um, it was passed successfully, and almost unanimously, um, and uh, will be going to President Biden to be signed to make lynching a federal hate crime, which also honors um, the life and legacy of Emmett Till and his mother Mamie Till, um, the 14-year-old uh, boy that was murdered in Money, Mississippi, back in 1955. So, look forward to receiving updates on both of those um, pieces of legislation. But moving on to the information that's already available, if we can go to slide two, there we go. Um, the Senate is, is for sentencing reform. Um, the Senate is considering now um, it's a couple of bills, <clears throat> a package of bills in addition to the Equal Act, which many of the network's faithful advocates have lobbied for last year and continue to do so. And um, that piece of legislation, in addition to Two, three others that are going to be considered as one um, will be are currently up for up for negotiations and and amendments and 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 whatnot. The um, Equal Act, which was a priority last year and it will be again this year, as far as advocacy days are concerned, is currently in the Judiciary Committee, as noted on the screen, and we are calling on not just uh, Senator Grassley. But many of the senators, um, many of our faithful partners, um, offices, as well as you know, even the ones that aren't so amenable to the Equal Act, we're calling on them to get this act passed. Um, <clears throat> it's it's a we know that <clears throat> um, in previous years, legislations have been passed that contributed to the war on drugs and the disenfranchisement of communities of color. Now is, the, now is the time in order to right those wrongs. And the Equal Act would do that in addition to the other three sentencing bills um, that are being considered. The First Step Implementation Act, um, the Prohibiting, uh, Prohibiting Punishment of Acquitted Conduct Act, and the COVID-19 Safer Detention Act. I will put in the chat our legislative update that was published um, back in February um, that will explain more so those bills. Um, but we will be sending out more information about advocacy, Hill meetings with certain senators um, in order to get these pieces of legislation passed. You can read more about those pieces of legislation. The package of three have already been, gone through committee and they're just waiting on their floor vote. So now is the time for us to act and make sure that these pieces of legislation gets passed. And now I would like to pass it over to my colleague to um, uh, to talk about the Build Back Better 2.0. Thank you so much, Christian. And welcome to everybody who is uh, joining us today. I, you, you, we cannot start a discussion on the Build Back Better uh, budget reconciliation process without a huge thank you to everybody that is on this webinar right now. Last year, we texted, we tweeted, you lettered, you called, you were there throughout the entire process, hoping and praying that uh, uh, that that bill would go forward. I think we were all very disappointed uh, when um, Senator uh, Joe Manchin from the state of West Virginia um, decided it was not the appropriate time uh, uh, to move forward and fully recognizing that that bill cannot move forward unless there is complete human unanimity on the uh, between the uh, Senate Democrats uh, and the White House. So, so let me begin with some good news. Hallelujah, 
Joe Manchin. Yep, he's a full-on Catholic, very faithful. So any of you in West Virginia, uh, if you can remind him, that would be a wonderful thing. Um, the, the, the good news that I want to start out with is what Mary alluded to earlier. The president has not given up on budget reconciliation, and neither should we. And so that is why you heard in the State of the Union the opening address about needing to lower costs uh, to families to, and to get uh, to get health care, to get child care, to get all the, the programs that we know are critical for the health of our communities, particularly those most vulnerable through. The nice thing that I, you may or may not have seen is that in reaction to the president's comments, Joe Manchin, put out his own wish list. And what I say of the most important piece about that is th uh, those of us in Washington thought that he may want to engage, but, but he is such a wild card, it's very hard to know. So the fact that he's actually in it, and I do believe he is in it, puts us in uh, a very, very hopeful uh, perspective not that necessarily we are going to get everything, all the multitude of programs that were part of the Build Back Better bill last year, but that we will make progress and substantive progress on some of our priorities. So, uh, so as the slide said, Joe has the pen. There are informal conversations going on right now between him and folks in the White House on what should be priorities, what is on his wish list. Um, what we know for a fact is that he wants a couple of things. Joe wants for your programs. So, so uh, you will note that in the Build Back Better bill, there were a number of programs for uh, very limited amounts of time. So his priorities is pick a few, make them permanent, and let's, and let's close the discussions. So we will see a few programs um, that will be permanent. Um, and so uh, we also know, as Mary alluded to, not only is the president talking about, uh, you know, taxing the rich and making sure people pay their fair share, so is Joe Manchin. So he has prioritized that all along. Um, he wants to write the, the tax code, which is right in line and mission with networks, uh, a piece of that. And he's very uh, curious and interested in trying to uh, also move forward with some healthcare bills, limiting the cost of prescription drugs and expanding some healthcare. So we are pretty confident that both the in the tax space and in the healthcare space that will move forward. In the past, he has spoken about childcare pre-K uh, pre services, very unclear where he is now. He has spoken about home uh, care, which is critically important for those with disabilities and for uh, older uh, uh, folks. Um, very importantly, um, he has really prioritized the climate aspect of uh, Build Back Better. Um, and so in terms of the list that he has spoken of to date, I think the two pieces, two or three pieces that we, we can suspect will definitely be in the bill are the tax elements, the, the healthcare elements and the climate elements. Let's go to the next slide. And I, I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna lay out the work perhaps for, for folks here. What is not on the list that we think are priorities? Um, I do want to start out uh, that discussion um, just to flag for you, you know, how fundamental the, the expansions of the child tax credit and the income tax credit, but particularly the child tax credit, have been to uh, at least begin to solve in very tangible ways poverty and child poverty in particular. You know, the, the evidence with those monthly payments is dramatic. Uh, in terms of putting cash into families' pockets to pay for health, to pay for food. So we are very focused on trying to see if we can get expansions of those refundable credits um, for poverty alleviation. That is a big uphill battle. Uh, we are not at all clear that Mr. Manchin wants those included, uh, but, but, but that is a big area where we are going to be pushing to, to make that happen. I think the other piece we are really focused on that has a good possibility, that's why they're higher up in the list, is in the housing space. 
when you talk to members of Congress and their staff, there is not a member we have spoken to that affordable housing is not a critical issue in their state or in their district. So we are hopeful that um, given the need um, that we can uh, slip in more housing money, that is also gonna be a very high priority. Um, the, 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 on the healthcare piece, uh, we, uh, I don't know if folks saw how successful the American Rescue Plan was uh, uh, in terms of giving people opportunities to sign up at reduced rates through some tax credits, remarkable success. We want to build on that success on two elements. And what those elements are, are one, finish the Affordable Care Act. We have 2.2 million people in the United States that do not have health care because gov governors have decided in 12 states not to provide health care to their people, even though it is fully paid for. So we are going to do our best in the healthcare space to push that forward, to close that loophole so that everybody has access to healthcare through the Affordable Care Act. We are also prioritizing the issues of black maternal health because black women are dying five times the rate uh, uh, that, uh, that uh, folks are dying in, in terms of childcare. You should not die because you're giving birth in this country. It, we have the highest rates in the developed world. We think we can fix them in this bill. That is priority. Um, Gina is going to talk to you about family leave. Uh, 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 we are we we will look every avenue we can to get family uh, and paid sick leave. It's critical for people to go back to work to be successful. Um, and finally, I'm going to leave Renette. I know she's going to talk to you about uh, our immigration work in, in total. Uh, and a lot of that revolves around making sure people um, have access to citizenship. So we are still pressing for that. Um, uh, and that stays on our list. So what does that mean for you? You, uh, just like Christian was saying, in the, in the sentencing space and in the criminal uh, uh, legal system reform space, we're going to be back. We know that we've got to get through the next probably month before conversations on Build Back Better really uh, move forward. But we are hopeful that in the June, July timeframe, we can celebrate together on the passage of what will be a historic bill. And with that, I have the privilege and the pleasure of, uh, of asking my colleague, Jarrett Smith, to join us to talk about fundamentally important work on HR 40. Go ahead. Thank you so much, Laura. Uh, first, I'd like to say uh, thank each and every one of you for joining us this afternoon. We cannot do this work here at Network uh, with your continued support. Uh, part of my portfolio at Network on the government relations team is HR 40, the reparations bill. This is a critical piece of legislation. I know you've heard that before, but uh, when President Biden was first elected last year, he put out an executive order that said that racial equity uh, was going to be a pillar of his administration. And uh, the agencies under uh, his control are looking at how they should uh, make racial equity a part of uh, running of those agencies and their policies. So HR 40, the reparations bill is been around for 33 years. It was first uh, uh, dropped by Representative John Conyers of Michigan. Uh, it has been introduced every year since then. It is based off of the Civil, Li Civil Liberties Act uh, in 1988 that gave uh, Japanese Americans uh, the uh, reparations for their false imprisonment during war, war, war II. Today, uh, the leader of uh, the HR 40 uh, uh, movement is being led by Representative Sheila Jackson Lee. And Representative Lee has done yeoman's work. We are only at a point where we need two additional co-sponsors for this bill. Speaker Pelosi has told us we need 218 
to get this bill to the floor. Currently, we have 216 members of the House that have said that they will support H.R. 40, uh, which is only a study. Please remember, this is just a study to look at the effects of slavery, Jim Crow, redlining, and a number of other federal policies and their impact on the Black community. The federal government pays for studies uh, each and every day in this country, and this is just will be another one that will uh, uh, be staffed by experts uh, that will be able to decide whether or not uh, reparations should be uh, a, a part of uh, uh, recommendations or, you know, for, for some, it, it may not be the case, but HR 40 gives us a chance to have that conversation, a conversation that has never uh, been a part of this country. Next slide, please. So how uh, do we get those last two uh, representatives to actually come on to say either they will co-sponsor or they will vote uh, for this piece of legislation? On the screen, you have nine members who, are, who we are calling our holdouts. What we need you to do is contact them uh, and ask them that they should be a part on the right side of history and support HR 40. Uh, the legislative calendar is not our front friend uh, this year. Uh, the midterms uh, uh, actual campaigning will be starting very soon. So we need to get this legislation to the floor immediately. So please, if you have a chance, call, text, email the representatives you see on the screen and ask them to say yes to HR 40. We are so close, everybody. We don't want to go into December and have to start all over again, the new Congress in January. We've never been at 216 uh, supporters for this piece of legislation. So for us, to take this home, you are the tipping point. You will make this a reality for us. So please reach out to the members on the screen and ask them to do the right thing and support HR 40. Thank you so much. And we really appreciate everything that you do to help our work here at Network Lobby. And I'll turn it over to my colleague, Gina. Hi, thanks, Jarrett. Um, that was wonderful. I'm always so moved by the work of my colleagues. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining us today. Um, as Mary mentioned, I'm really excited to talk about labor this week because um, President Biden was so supportive of so many of these critical issues in his State of the Union address, which is so incredibly impactful and shows how critical this work is. Um, so I'm going to walk through a few of our labor priorities for 2022, and I hope you all are as excited about them as I am. Um, we're going to start out with the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which has been a long priority of networks and a wide coalition. Um, this legislation is some of my favorite to work on because it is bipartisan, common sense, and popular, um, and we're really close to getting this done. Um, which makes it even more exciting. Um, so we're affectionately calling this our, our big push to pass the Pregnant Workers Fairness Act, which bans pregnancy discrimination in the workplace and ensures that pregnant workers don't have to sacrifice the health and safety of themselves um, for a paycheck to ensure the economic security of their families. Um, this legislation just needs a vote on the Senate so it can be signed by President Biden. We are currently putting a ton of effort to attach this legislation as an amendment to the FY 2022 appropriations package, which is the budget. Um, it ha has you know, 11 co-sponsors in the Senate and had a great bipartisan support in the House. So it is very possible that this month we could see this legislation pass, um, which would be so incredibly impactful for so many low income um, and disproportionately black and brown mothers who um, are in the workplace doing critical, critical work. 
Um, and if it doesn't get attached in the budget, that does not mean our fight is done. We will keep pushing until this bill is passed. And I am really honored to be able to do this work for, for pregnant workers everywhere. Um, another major priority, as Laura mentioned, is paid family and medical leave. While paid family and medical leave is not on Joe Manchin's uh, perfect wish list, that does not mean that the need is not still there and that workers are desperately in need of paid family and medical leave as we enter the second anniversary of COVID um, shutdowns in this country. So what does that look like? What, what are we doing and how, how can we close these gaps that are so critically needed? Um, there's a few options here, which is nice to have options. So most excitedly is that the administration recently included emergency sick leave for those diagnosed with COVID and who need to care for loved ones with COVID in his COVID-19 emergency preparedness package um, and his proposal essentially to Congress. So we are working extensively to see what we can do to get that passed as quickly as possible to ensure um, that this is a public health measure and that people do not have to go to work sick with COVID. Um, there are other paths forward as well, which is wonderful. Um, you know, sometimes it's about incremental progress and bills like the Job Protection Act, which um, expands FMLA, which is unpaid leave, um, to ensure that it's actually universal unpaid leave and no worker is excluded, um, is really critical. A network is proud to support those efforts as it's just recently been reintroduced into the House. Um, this also includes working on things like um, the Family Act, which has been around for a long time and Network has been a longtime supporter of, which would introduce a national paid leave program. Um, so there's lots of avenues and lots of opportunities for advocacy, which we will keep you up, updated on. And um, this, this policy, this general policy is so critical to ensuring people safely get back into the workforce. Our most recent job reports have shown that um, women are still 1 million jobs short of their pre-pandemic numbers, and this is an equity issue. Um, to ensuring that women have the support they need and all caregivers have the support they need um, to, to do that safely. Um, and then lastly, but certainly not least, we're going to talk about the Protecting the Right to Organize Act, which is the PRO Act, which we have also been longtime supporters of. Um, this is kind of broad sweeping labor law reform that kind of brings us into the 21st century and makes um, electing a union all, all the easier as it should be and stops union busting um, practices from employers and ensures that those regulations are enforceable um, by our government and make sure that workers have the right to democratically choose to, to join a union. Um, this bill has 48 co-sponsors in the, in the Senate, so we're still short of our, our full Democratic caucus, um, but we are tireless in this effort just as um, workers are tireless in unionizing. We've seen a really big wave since COVID-19 has hit of workers demanding the benefits of a union. And we know that um, a union contract is one of the best methods we have to close racial and gender income gaps. Um, it often leads to better healthcare uh, and benefits overall, safer workplaces, and are really inherent to ensuring the dignity of work and the worker. Um, and that's sort of the pillar of all three of these pieces of our priorities for this year, right? We, it's core to, to our work to recognize um, that the work each and every one of us do every day um, is so filled with dignity and so essential to, to, to the society we built together. Um, so I am so excited for all of our work together this year, and I am so thrilled to pass it on to Christian Watkins to talk about democracy. All right. <clears throat> Thank you, Gina. And I am back. Now, uh, as a democracy update, I want to reiterate the fact that uh, that network is proud and privileged to support Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson's nomination for the Supreme Court. If you go to our uh, go to our page, you'll see. If you go to the um, network page um, and also to Twitter, all of, across social media, um, we've voiced our support, and we ask you to sign on to the support letter that's been published. Um, her historic opportunity to be to be seated on the Supreme Court um, cannot be dismissed or denied. So we ask you to take action <clears throat> through signing that letter, and uh, we will be giving updates on the progress of her nomination. And um, so look forward to hearing for, from us on that. In regards to <clears throat> in regards to uh, President Biden's State of the Union address continues. Um, he continued to advocate for um, a voting rights to be a priority of congressional members. 
And he specifically named the Freedom to Vote Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act, and also um, the uh, democracy is strengthened by casting light on spending in elections, the Disclose Act. Those three pieces of legislation will um, fix the failures of the past. It would restore the 1964 uh, Voting Rights Act um, and also secure, make better our electro electoral processes moving forward, uh, especially after the previous years of, of disenfranchisement of um, voting polling locations being closed in minority communities and, and all of the election integrity and security issues that we've had. We, we know about redlining. We know about congressional redistricting, redistricting that, that happens. And we know about the dark money that happens in, with campaigns about corporations and individuals not disclosing um, massive amounts of money that go into political campaigns. So these bills will rectify that situation. As of right now, um, negotiations and, uh, uh, and conversations on Capitol Hill about these pieces of legislation have gone, um, have, have all but gone dark. <clears throat> Um, given the Senate's failure to act on it back uh, in January. But as of right now, um, what we can do, what we what we all can do is continue to call on our senators to to put these bills back on the floor, to call them back and to actually support their passage through the U.S. Senate so that these provisions can be become law. Um, and with that, um, since conversations are, since there's other priorities, uh, the war in Ukraine, unfortunately, and other pieces of legislation that are taking up legislation, legislative energy, your phone calls and your emails to your senators about those pieces of legislation are necessary. But it's also incumbent upon you all to uh, monitor your local elections. Make sure that whenever there's a local election, whether state or district or county, um, to to volunteer, to get in get in the works of things, to make sure that you're taking your opportunity, to make sure that you're taking the opportunity um, to be a part of the process, whether it is through poll watching, or um, or any any of the uh, uh, ways to assist with other folks voting, um, whether it's registering them to vote or also being an election an election clerk. And through those efforts, we can assure that any problems that arise are observed and also um, noted by the appropriate organizations. You can let us know. You can let the ALCU, ACLU know. You can let your um, state, your state's attorneys and election officials know about those problems as well. Be vigilant in this process, and a democracy will be upheld. But we also need for those federal level. Uh, pieces of legislation to move forward successfully so that they can become law. And now I will pass it along to Renette in order to give us our immigration update. Thank you so much, Christian. Hi, everybody. And as you know, as Gina and others, I am so blown away by my colleagues' faith-filled work here. Um, in terms of immigration, as Laura was saying, for Build Back Better, uh, we are still uh, pushing a pathway to citizenship in different ways. First, through the Build Back Better or the reconciliation, when there is another reconciliation uh, or another reiteration of reconciliation that, that would come up, we, we will push as hard as we can uh, to get that into the bill. But while we are doing that, uh, we are also pushing for the pathway to citizenship in different ways. And, in, and in, through different avenues, <clears throat> excuse me, in legislation. And the first way is through appropriations. Um, these are smaller, not like a big pathway to citizenship, but it all supports a pathway to citizenship. Uh, through appropriations, we are asking for funding for legal representation, uh, 50 million US dollars in the um, appropriations bill for legal representation for immigrants. Immigrants, as you may know, do have the right to representation, but they, there are no public defenders for them right now. Um, we're also asking for funding for the United States Citizenship and Immigration Services to stop the backlogs. This also supports 
know, getting green cards, getting citizenship, and supporting a pathway to citizenship. Appropriations, and we are all asking for this in the FY 2022 appropriations, which the vote would hopefully come up soon. And you will get um, an email in your inbox in the next couple of weeks on how we can support that. Uh, we are in our you know, push for pathway to citizenship. We are also going pushing for, to, for, for new legislation. And this would be down the line in a couple of months. So right now, what we're working on is to have more and more co-sponsors for these bills. Uh, one of them is Lift the Bar Act. Um, that bill focuses on making sure that documented immigrants get, uh, are, are able to get federal programs. So one of the biggest problems during the pandemic, this is in March or April of 2020, uh, even a green card holder would, was not able to get tested and under a federal program because there are certain bars in, in law uh, where a green card holder has to wait five years to be able to, have federal, to get to federal programs. So this bill will um, lift that bar. Uh, the other one is the other bill that we'll be working on and building support, getting co-sponsors on uh, is called Real Courts Rule of Law Act. Uh, this is also in the house. Uh, and this is a new bill. It was just introduced a couple of months ago, like last month, I believe, February. And this would make immigration courts um, into real courts, uh, with, <laughs> which, where it won't come under the Department of Justice, where it would be, uh, where we have the structures of a regular judiciary. Um, and for those of you who might know right now, immigration judges are employees of the Department of Justice. Um, which is the administration, and uh, the 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 one of the one of the litigants is always ICE or CBP. Um, again, another administration official, so the judge, and one side is always um, the is working for the administration, any administration against or and asked to judge the same thing. So it's like brother and sister asking who should be in the house. Uh, when there is an outsider or they're trying to say who the outsider is. So this is like nothing that like um, the structure is clearly nothing like what, what justice should be at this point. That's why we want to change that. Um, next slide, please. So the other big bucket that we're working on is border policy and ensuring there'll be non-detention or non-incarceral state for immigrants, especially. Um, and in that, we uh, are also working to ensure that the, the, the vehicles of there, we will work on that is to work again through appropriations for funding, uh, for shelters at the border and for local groups, rather than big, any detention um, organizations or det private detention firms. Uh, we will be asking the CBP to, or the, the um, Congress to reduce funding for detention, as well as to fund oversight mechanisms of ICE and CBP. Again, this is through appropriations um, and we hope it'll happen in the next two weeks. We are also looking at new comprehensive legislation. We have actually been working on that for about two or three years where both um, there will be protections for both refugees and asylum seekers where, where asylum, asylum seekers would be uh, protected through different, will have a, a protection of the rule of law, protection of due process, which they don't have now. This, uh, this comprehensive legislation has not been introduced, but we are hoping that it will be introduced by June. Um, it is ready, it is just, we just need the right time. Uh, and we are also, part of our job is also to prevent um, legislation that pursue deterrence policies. Um, so the, the two big um, bills that we'll be working to prevent uh, com coming into law is the Bipartisan Border Solutions Act, which is in the Senate, and the Dignity Act, which is in the House. Uh, this, both of these uh, push forward a carceral state. They push forward for the building of prisons at the border um, and expedited removal. So clearly everything that we are against. 
Uh, that is, you know, in a nutshell, our immigration portfolio portfolio in the legislative space today. And I will be happy to answer any questions as will others. So I will pass it on to Meg. Well, great. Thank you so much, Mary and Christian and Laura and Jarrett and Gina and Renette for just all of your wisdom and insight and staying on top of all of this legislation that is percolating that we've been waiting for for so long. Um, so if you could just all turn on your cameras now, we definitely have some questions from um, our viewers and thank you so much everyone for typing in such thoughtful questions. Um, so first, Jarrett, I think you've already been alerted, but there is a lot of excitement about HR 40. Um, and just the fact that we're only two co-sponsors away. But first, but first I, uh, before, before we start talking about where those representatives, what states they're in and stuff, if I don't live in one of those states, should I still pick up the phone and call? Uh, bug this member of Congress if I'm not their constituent? Uh, Meg, thank you for the question. And I, I am putting the list with uh, the actual districts that these members represent in the chat. Uh, you should see it now. Please call. I mean, we're at a point that we need everyone to call. It doesn't matter. This is the story. It doesn't matter if you live in that district or not. We need them on this bill. So call. If you have family members in the district, have them call also. But please pick up the phone, send an email, text, whatever necessary to get just these last two members on this bill and be a part of history. Thank you. All right. So just looking in the chat here, Representative Cartwright from the 8th District of Pennsylvania, Sharice Davis from Kansas, the third district, Rep. Jared Golden from Maine, the second district, Rob Kind, Wisconsin three, Stephanie Murphy, Florida seven, Rep. O'Halloran in Arizona one, Schrader from Oregon five, Schreier from Washington eight, and Abigail Spanberger in Virginia seven. And yes, if you live in those districts, please call them if you have family members who live or friends who live in those districts, have them call. And this will definitely go out in the follow-up email because we are two away. It's very, very exciting. Meg, Meg if I may, yes. uh, I, I would like to highlight our Catholic uh, brothers here. Uh, please uh, note that Representative Cartwright and Representative Halloran are Catholic and uh, they would love to hear from you. So uh, contact their offices and, and let them know uh, that we need the spirit to move uh, in their offices and get this across the finish line. If we just get those two Catholic brothers, uh, <laughs> it's done. So, so I, I just want to highlight uh, a couple of, of our you know, members, uh, Catholic members. Thank you, Meg. Thank you, Jarrett. Thanks so much. All right, let me look at a few more of these questions. So many people, there was a flurry of what are we gonna do for this? So great. Um, so Laura, just a question about uh, our favorite, uh, Senator Manchin, um, in terms of his proposal for Build Back Better. Is, did you feel, do we feel like at this point, is it that he's concerned about the money for these programs or does he have other issues? What, what is Holt keeping him back? Yeah, but Megan, that is a great question. And I hope folks realized uh, when Mary was framing out the way the president was framing uh, the State of the Union, it was very much intended to raise his fundamental concerns. So, so when you talk to Joe Manchin's office or you read about what he's saying in the press, you know, he is definitely very concerned about inflation, um, as we all are. You know, when you see prices uh, coming up, 
Uh, you know, that definitely is a pocketbook issue for, uh, uh, for all of us, but particularly for those who struggle. And I think the, in his mind, now there are many, many uh, people smarter than I who are economists, I mean, this is not the case, but that's okay. You know, he thinks that because we have done such robust government spending that that, that has led to inflation. Um, so, um, so Meg, I think the, the, the reality of trying to uh, kind of take away some of those inflationary pressures um, part of the, the, his reason for wanting to do the tax work and, and the pharma work is to save money so that you can spend down debt that will have a good inflationary impact. Um, um, the other piece and the way kind of we're framing it in conversations with his office and others is, look, at when people actually get a check uh, uh, monthly, um, that they use for food, or frankly, when people pay $50 for healthcare rather than $300 that they were paying before, you know, that all accrues to the benefit of folks uh, that are struggling in our support. So, so you're, the language you're going to see us use, even, even with you, uh, uh, for those in the field, is really to emphasize that this is money in people's pockets. These are pocket uh, book issues and a way to alleviate inflation, not to spur inflation on. So, so, uh, so Meg, we are just, uh, I am just, I cannot tell you how happy I am that he is in the game on the tax issues. His political calculation is that he does not believe that he can get bipartisan support from Republicans from pulling back their big 2017 a tax giveaway to the wealthiest and to corporations. He's 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 straight up right on that. So let's use this opportunity. Let's make the tax code better because that that is one of our objectives. And I'm thinking of Sister Emily and Colin doing all the work we did on taxes. Let let's take that and then uh, spend some of that money on climate protections, on uh, checks to kids and their families, on health care, you know, the things that really will make a huge impact for families. Absolutely. Thanks so much, Laura. Um, being mindful of time here, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Uh, Gina, so many labor bills that you're working on that you are leading network on right now in our field. But why are we not working on raising the minimum wage? Well, I'm very excited to say that we do work on raising the minimum wage. Um, when I was choosing what to talk about in my, my five minutes of this webinar, I chose the things that I felt had the most momentum and are most likely to move in this year. That does not mean they are the sum total of our priorities. And Network is a proud endorser of the Raise the Wage Act of 2021, um, which has been introduced in the House. Unfortunately, because of such tight numbers in the House and Senate, and it's not universal uh, bipartisan support, it just um, is, a, is a harder move. That doesn't mean we don't talk about the incredible need for a livable wage um, and the fact that our minimum wage has been stagnant for, I, I believe we're uh, just way too long at this point. I believe Obama was president when we last week raised the minimum wage. Um, so we've also taken other steps um, to address this issue administratively. Um, and that includes um, things like um, uh, federal contractors getting a $15 minimum wage, which President Biden has supported. And we have submitted comments to roll back some Trump administration rules that um, allowed workers some misclassifications and reduce their wages overall because we still have uh, sub minimum wages, which means if you're a tipped worker, like somebody who works at a restaurant, you can be paid less than the 725 minimum wage. Um, so we're, we're taking other steps where we can um, but we are proud to work on the minimum wage and would love to see that move. Great. Thanks so much, Gina. Yes. I'm like, we do work on it. <laughs> so thank you. Yes. Um, goodness. So many good questions here. Renette, can you speak a little bit more on the two bills uh, about um, the legislation on immigration deterrence. Um, sure. It seems there's a little concern about if we're waiting for June for this legislation, for this uh, legislation to change, um, that that might be too late in terms of the midterms. Oh, the, the comprehensive um, 
the comprehensive legislation. Uh, so that is what we're waiting till June. Uh, so this is this. So that is uh, that we're playing the long game. So the, again, um, in terms of of a, a more comprehensive legislation, uh, we are definitely playing the long game. It's not going to happen this year. We will be building support. Uh, that is more of a building. We'll be constantly building support. It is also a legacy bill for Senator Lee, uh, Leahy. Um, that, so he wants to introduce it. And then um, we have got some bipartisan uh, support on that because of him. Uh, so that is the comprehensive legislation uh, that we'll be working on. But that, you know, I was uh, like Gina, like I was talking mainly about the legislation here. That doesn't mean that we're not going to work on anything um, uh, border wise or immigration wise as i said you know we will definitely be pushing back against terrible border legislation um and we will also be trying to get funds to uh, make sure there is some sort of um, oversight rule of law uh, a better options for uh, immigrants who come to our southern border and then we will also be working on our administrative work which is in title 42 um, and MPP. So that would be a much more um, immediate focus. So there's just, so the, 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 the longer term one that would be introduced in June, that's just a comprehensive and that is a building. Yes, that will take time, but that doesn't mean that, you know, we're not going to do anything else and, and people are going to simply uh, be um, left out in the cold. Uh, we hope not. We will be working to make sure that uh, there will be more immediate responses as well. Great, thank you so much. Um, we are definitely out of time for questions, but for those whose questions have not been answered, we have your name and your email, and um, I will share these with our government relations team, and they will respond to you. Uh, you know, within a week, we're we're pretty prompt on this. So, um, so thank you, thank you for your patience and. Um, and we will definitely get back to you on these important questions. All right, so wrapping up here, uh, just want to two important, very exciting events that Network is having as part of our 50th anniversary celebration. The first, um, my goodness, we have over 1400 people who have already registered. Um, it is our half day long virtual conference on white supremacy and American Christianity, a conversation with Robert P. Jones and Father Brian Massengill. You can sign up to just be at the conversation or you can sign up for the conversation and the small group discussion after. So we really hope that you can join us for this event. Uh, it is being co-sponsored by Faith in Action and Sojourners. And so it is a truly an ecumenical discussion about what we can do about our church, about white supremacy, and we'll really set the table for our work this fall in the election. We also have uh, here in Washington, DC, uh, later in April, our 50th anniversary advocates training and gala. The focus, the policy focus for that training, um, well, you'll certainly receive training in educating, organizing, and lobbying with a policy focus on the, um, on the sentencing reform bills that we heard Christian talk about. So, so please go to uh, Network 50 uh, to sign up for that. And you'll also be receiving this in the follow-up email. And, um, and every issue that we uh, talked about today are definitely things we will be engaging you on, whether it's through email, through text, text alerts, um, you know, continued policy webinars. So make sure that you are connected with us. Uh, you can follow us on social media. Um, you know, if you get action alerts through your email, you can also sign up for text alerts on our website. So there are lots of ways to, to keep engaged on all of our policy issues. So thank you so much uh, for joining us. Thank you to Mary and to, my to the rest of my colleagues on government relations, Laura, Christian, Jarrett, Gina, and Renette. We're just so glad that you could join us.
And, um, and thank you, Emily, for tech and for all of my other colleagues uh, for supporting this webinar. Have a great evening.